Hello, and welcome to the wrap up of day three of our Senior Dog Care Summit. It has really been a lot of fun, exciting, a lot of things happening, and I hope you've been able to rehydrate after all of the exercise discussion that we had this morning. Uh, first off, what I want to do is uh, to thank our sponsors. So we have the Healing Vet with Whole Energy Body Balance. So we want to give a shout out and a big thank you to Dr. Ed. And then also Tom, who has the Revitavet Therapeutic Systems, uh, is also one of our other sponsors. So we want to thank them for their input and their contribution towards the program, too. So I hear that we've been having a lot of interest from all over the globe. And um, this is a super exciting opportunity to be able to share this knowledge and data and uh, really help other people that may not have access to this kind of information. So that's all really, really cool. And then what I wanted to do too, was just to share with you all what would be the upgrade. So if you all decide that you want to take the masterclass that I'll be doing, the Life Extend Method masterclass after the summit, you will get my very own Conversations with Animals. This is my biography. So it's a story of my life, but it's really about the animals in my life. And the biographer that contacted me when he asked, I said, yeah, that would be that would be fun because it'd be another way for me to share uh, the importance of animals in our lives. But I said, it's not going to be some reality show. Uh, you can have the storyline, but then there's a lot of animal stories. So I've written the, the animal part. So it's a, a segue of, of his writing and my writing. Then you're also going to get the entire upload for my stretching and exercises for dogs. So this is, there's a lot of videos on this and it walks you through uh, the zones of the body. So there's front leg exercises, there's rear leg exercises, there's one for balancing, there's uh, some in their videos for the neurological proprioceptive deficits, there's for back, there's strengthening, there's flexibility. Anyway, you can just click on them as you go through and uh, watch little bits. So you don't have to watch the whole thing. And then there's uploads that walk you through step by step on paper that you can print out. So you get that. Then you also get the full Tai Chi Wawa program. That's my low impact dog exercise. It works for cats like it. Um, even um, a tech that worked with me had a rat that had brain problems and the rat would have like headaches and little seizures. And he did some of that with the rat that opens up the, the movement of nerve input through the body. And the rat really liked it too. And then also you get my how to customize nutrition book. So with that is a survey that's, that you can fill out on the dog. And then it helps you to prioritize which body systems are struggling and then how to nutritionally approach that. So those are all some of the extras that you would get by signing up for my post-summit masterclass, the Life Extend Method. All righty. Then for today, what we want to do is have a little bit of a summary on the program. So as you all saw, today started with my program about harness fitting and how that harness is like wearing a bad bra. And at least 50% of you out there have to be women, probably a few more than that. but uh, for those, I'm sure uh, when you saw that, you had a reality of, of what this can be. And then the impact on the body, I went through <clears throat> the effect that can have from proprioception, from body posture, from uh, uh, affecting visceral organs, where you've got trigger points and acupuncture points that are constantly being bombarded and traumatized. So uh, thank you, Glenda. She said it was truly eye-opening. And uh, it, it is when you really look at it from that full global impact. So hopefully having that guide, and, and, and the real frustrating thing is that you can go online, you can look at all kinds of harnesses, you can see them now that actually show the dog trying to sell it that doesn't, isn't right. And then understanding that it's one of those things you really gotta try them on, just like bras. They can look good on the package, they can look good on the model, you order it up, you get it home, and it's like, okay, this one's going back, or I'll find somebody else to give it to. So that was all about that one. And then um, the second, oh, yes, then we had Dr. Angel. 
about kinesio taping and reflexology, uh, Reiki, sorry, kinesio taping and Reiki for senior dogs. And uh, I think you would have, hers was very hands-on. She was showing you demonstrations of how to do these things so that you can take it and implement those. So when we look at the kinesio tape, um, it reduces pain. It's going to improve the proprioception, so the awareness of the mind to where the body is and making better connections there, which improves that neurologic programming. Also increasing lymphatic circulation, so it's gonna help move out the trash, and then to support any injured tissue that you might be dealing with. So it does this by when the tape goes on, uh, stimulating nerve endings and blocking those nociceptors. So that's the receptors that feel the sense of the pain. So as I was watching Dr. Angel's program today, I've been dealing the past couple of days with a left wrist that's been painful and I've been trying to adjust it myself. I'm waiting to get in the chiropractor and I thought, ah, hey, bud, you got all kinds of kinesio tape. So I got it out and roll and put it on and my wrist is already feeling better. So it's a little simple thing. It's not hard to do, but the impact on it, almost instantaneous. And then um, the fact that it can help over a period of time. So hours and days to help continue that healing process. Alrighty. So then also she had uh, demonstrations on the Reiki. And I thought that was really, really cool too, that you could see how the dog responded as she was going through that. And so the Reiki is done by improving that energy flow of the innate, uh, the universal force, the chi, the prana, it's all the same. And as Dr. Angel pointed out, not everybody would be effective at this because you have to have your chakras open for that flow to move. And you also wanna have that good intent. You know, that feeling like sometimes you're around somebody and you get home after you've been around them all day and you're just like exhausted because they drained you. And then other times you can be around somebody and you get invigorated. So you want to be able to do that good invigoration on the animals that you're doing this with. And as you saw, it didn't take a lot of time and, and to start seeing the improvement in the dog. So anyway, that one was really, really cool. The next we had uh, Bobby Lyons and the Senior Dog Fitness. So with her program, we were talking about opening all of those neural pathways. Uh, we discussed about where is weight being shifted. So it's about observing that posture of your dog. Like, is there balance? You have to get that like fine eye tune. Um, we looked at changes of behavior that come along with improving the posture. Also, she talked about stacking, being able to have those joints as they're supposed to be on top of each other. We looked at that. She also talked about watching out for your dog's fatigue point and to go slow with these older ones, paying attention to their posture because a change in the posture could be an indication of that fatigue, to not do too much too fast, and that it is okay to have a rest day or an active rest day where there's unorganized fitness, to allow them to have that time to regenerate that these fitness programs really only need to be three or maybe at the most five days a week. So everybody can have a, a mental rest day and a recovery time. Her targets, uh, we did talk a little bit about equipment and in any kind of equipment that you're using, as she stressed, you always wanna start with a flat surface and they have to be doing that correctly before you move to any kind of elevation. And then after that is being done perfectly, then you can add that extra of trying to balance on things. And the whole point is that fitness can be fun. So that was that one. Then number four, okay. So Joanne Lang, was that one not awesome? Because it was so you could just watch it and then like have your dog there and then be doing that massage along the way. And if there was any reason that you were thinking about upgrading to the VIP, but you hadn't decided about that yet, this would be the perfect time to be able to have this program forever. Not that it's gonna, it's not gonna disappear in the two days, the 48 hours, but you could always go back and refer to her video um, about how to do that massage. She was very, I mean, her demonstrations were hands-on, step-by-step, 
went slow. Um, her Lang Institute for Canine Massage, she does have programs certainly that you can sign up for too. Um, in her program, we talked about, she talked about how movement matters and um, that you want to be able to do things better and improve any poor movements, improve the top lines. And she took pictures and showed how what good is and then what bad would be. And I thought it was really cute too, as she was going along at first, the little boy dog, he was kind of watching her and checking out what she was doing. And then at one point you see him and he's like flat over asleep. It's like, oh, this is so good. I'm just checking out. So that was really, really cute. Uh, and then showed you about doing the circles. And that is one of the things too, that I start with when a dog has had an injury or they're kind of stiff is see how it was a wider area, not to make them do things that are so tight. I'll even have people like go around a tree in their yard, practicing that type of thing. So her focus was then keep a sparkle in their eye and pep in their step. And I thought that was really clever, cute. Alrighty, then number five, Donna Wills. She was a whole lot of fun because here we are across the waterway over in Great Britain getting to talk to her about physiotherapy. So she spent a lot of time and her lot of years in, in this profession and has seen it come in from all aspects. So I thought for her program, it was important that you could get a perception of what it would be like to go to a, a physiotherapist or some kind of a physical therapy type program, depending on what it's called, wherever you live, and get an idea of what to expect when you schedule an appointment. And one of her points was that it's about empowering you, empowering you to be able to create in whatever your life plan is, this better program for the dog. So it's about customizing. It's seeing you and your pet live and it's working to create however much time you have, whatever finances you have, what's going to work best for the two of you. So it's a win-win. We looked at uh, weaknesses, what kind of weaknesses could be present that you would look at, um, that the weakness is actually a sign though. The weakness is not the problem. It's just the sign that there's something going on. And we look at also obesity and how that extra weight made more of an effect of gravity pull on those already stressed joints. So she gave her outline of what she looks at for assessing obesity. So that was a little bit different in the program. Talked a little about different uh, mobility and equipment that can be used, some that are things that you have at home. So it's not about having to invest in something, it's about keeping things simple. And her goal, too, is about the mental aspect and doing things that keeps their mind alive and actually keeps them happy. It's that happiness quotient that is really important as well, the mental impact and wanting to get them happy to where they get that serotonin going out there. And that's going to also not only improve their daytime happiness, we get the pineal gland working, then the melatonin comes in at night and they'll sleep better. So as we go into tomorrow's program, which is about distress and aging and age-related diseases and trying to keep them comfortable, we'll talk some more about that too. Also, Donna talked about for you to not feel guilty that your dog is getting older, that um, life does change, and that certainly those of you watching this Part of your goal is to be able to make this transition of lifetime be more pleasurable, enjoyable, and having fun. So as Donna said, you can have a realistic plan and that there are a lot of things out there that are available. And then last but certainly not least was Laurie Edge Hughes coming in from Canada. And uh, she presented novel ways to exercise the older dog. And her pre presentation added some other points that we haven't had. Uh, she looked at aerobic exercise, she looked at muscle strength, muscle endurance, flexibility, and body composition. And her focus for these older ones is about power training and function. And she talked about how power has to do with strength and speed. And adding in some resistance training, 
which those types of exercises are easy for a person to do where you're pushing against the force. But it's a little clever how Laurie has created this resistance training in dogs because it's not as easy. You have to be creative. And so she gave examples of showing on the video and pictures of doing that with some dogs in different ways. Um, she also talked about uh, changes in the muscle with age and how the body loses those type 2 fibers, which is about the strength and the speed. This is the type that's the sprinter fibers. And I just want to say that we're, we always are learning. And I've learned a lot through all the different presenters that we've had in this program. And today, as I was re-watching Laurie's to get my little points here, I realized that my dog, who's two and a half, is a hound dog. And they're more about the type one fibers. So the endurance going along, running, running, running after that raccoon. And depending on how far the dog goes, my son who, who does this is a hobby profession. Uh, sometimes the dog may go a little distance or other ones may go miles. He's got one that would run six, seven, eight miles. And then once they get to the tree and they've got the raccoon up in the tree, they have to stay there, which is also endurance in that position. And they're barking and barking so that you can find them, but it takes you a while to get there. So, so that breed focuses a lot on that, but they also in between have to have those type two fibers. And with my dog being on a leash and we go for her olfactory journeys, I realized that I'm not doing enough at cultivating during these early years these muscle two, type two muscle fibers. So what I'm looking at now, I'm thinking, geez, Ava, if I don't do some prep work, she is going to be one of those older dogs that looks like she has neurologic problems because she's not having the right posture. She's not getting herself pushed up well, but it would really be a lot of that, which they may look like neurologic problems is a big part that they've just lost a lot of these type two muscle fibers and they can't navigate because of the muscle, not because maybe the nerve function would be there if the muscles could work. So thinking about what we see from what really is it that's created it. So at any rate, I've got to change up my program and put in a little bit more aerobic sprinting for the dog. Alrighty, so um, she had lots of different examples, uh, lots of walkthroughs, and then she also had lists of cautions and things to watch out for. So I'm hoping that you all got something out of some of those programs today, because I certainly did. And I've gone through them twice. So there's always something else to, to find out. Uh, alrighty, so we're going to open this up to questions and uh, things that we have from today. With a few comments here of other people uh, about doing the circles. So the Lang circles, um, like in the idea for the trees. Another one that you can use Ottomans in your house, depending on what the weather is, too. Um, oh, OK, uh, so Carol's talking about um, oh, that she's still working on catching up on some of the programs. So here we have one. It says, uh, do you personally use infrared therapy for your patients? That's part of the question. And then do I find it beneficial? And if so, what conditions? OK. What conditions in dogs primarily receive the greatest benefits from this type of therapy? All right, so I do use the low level laser. I've, as I said yesterday, this infrared therapy type, this laser infrared therapy, I started with in like 1998. So I've been using it a long time. So we can use it as a pre exam treatment. So if I have a dog that comes in that is, you have to realize my practice is pretty much uh, rehab. It's pretty much what I do other than I also see animals with chronic conditions. So any allergies, liver problems, kidney problems, digestive problems, all of those I can look at from that nutritional perspective of what I do. So for the ones that come in live, a lot of them do come in and they're stiff. Uh, ones that are a little bit apprehensive because they have a sore zone, we might do the, the laser prior to doing my adjustments and my exam. Uh, it's a great way to gently warm the tissue, get the circulation so that they can move and bend better. So you certainly can do it for those older bodies that are stiff and rigid. Anywhere that there's inflammation, any kind of wounds, uh, the dogs with the lick granulomas, 
you know, the problem with the lit granuloma is not here or here, wherever they're doing the licking. It's not that spot, while it might have a neuritis, so it's got these nerve endings that are tingling, the biggest part of that cycle of why it goes on and on and on is because there's problem here. It's the stress thing. It's just like a person who's a chain smoker. If they mentally get upset, they're going to smoke more cigarettes. A person who's a nail biter, I have to say I'm guilty for that. Uh, when I get stressed or I'm watching too much of an exciting movie and I'm trying to help solve it, I'll bite on my nails. So I can always tell when I'm not stressed because my nails will grow out and then the polish looks really good. Otherwise, I'm struggling to hide my nails. So the mental stress can cause an individual to focus on a body part. And the dogs certainly do that, too. So um, when we talk about that, as far as the infrared, it can help locally. But the other part, which we will have this in tomorrow's program, is about doing cranial electrotherapy stem where you put little clips on the ears and you present a wave pattern that is of the alpha band, that is where we run electrically, the bodies, individuals. When you're happy, you're not stressed, you don't have any pain, no worries, be happy when all that's going on. So I think that pretty much covers that one there. I mean, and, then, and the infrared, you could use, even if you had colic, abdominal pain, I had a client with a new baby and they had had one of these for their dog and the baby was having colic problems. I go, put that on the baby's tummy. The baby, the colic will subside better and the baby will be able to sleep and so will you. All righty, so there's that one. All right, so Cindy asks for me to recommend a good harness design for a deep-chested Gordon Setter who is also a leash puller on walks. Okay, so here's the thing. I don't know how old the Setter is, but the Setter is still strong enough to pull hard. When you use a harness, and there you're going for a walk. They will be able to use that harness as a brace and actually pull very well. I mean, that's why dog sleds and that, they have harnesses on them because they can use that to get their body in it and against it and actually pull more. So I'm not saying that using a harness is gonna stop the pulling on the walk. Really what I like are the prong collars for that because the dog is respectful. So instead of a regular collar where they're themselves are this harness where they're still pulling so hard that you have to like be super strong is that prong collar, which can be totally loose. You want to have it not that it's always touching them because they have to have a reward for backing off. So a little bit of space there that gives them that reward, just like when you're working on a horse with a bit, you can't be in the mouth all the time because then there's no reward. There's no, yeah, you're doing it right. So the prong collar and then they're in it when they're pulling, but then they're off of it because they don't want it that way. So that's where you're going to get the most respect. Okay. So the question about the harness really is that you have to go try some on. There are a lot of different styles and you have to get it fit right. So one that goes like, like a breast collar would on a horse, that's not across the shoulder. You don't want it crossing over that glenohumeral joint. They have to be able to reach forward. One that goes down the sternum is fine, branches out up here. Um, and then also making sure like a Gordon is gonna be a longer body dog. So you don't want one that's really small and tight and is like crimped right behind the scapula and over the ribs. So you gotta have a longer one for them. Um, and it's about trying them on like the bras. Not a direct one. Here's your answer. This one fits all of those kind. Alrighty, uh, let's see here. Then next we have, okay, the, uh, Carol's question, you guys will just have to kind of jump in on there. Uh, uh, halty head collars work well, but there is no strength. Yeah, and the halty's fine too, as long as, oh, my dog hated it. Uh, and also you have to make sure that it's even tension. So like if you have the halty and it's always pulling from one side, over time, you could affect the temporal mandibular joint with, with pulling one direction or another. So you always want to make sure that when you're doing whatever apparatus we're putting on them, that you have equal tension and pull on both sides. So otherwise, down the road, over weeks, days, months, years, then you will create a condition that you didn't think about. Alrighty, so here we have one from Nancy. Hello, Nancy. 
what exercise is recommended for an eight-year-old Boston Terry who has developed full cataracts over the past two years and basically blind? In 2019, she was a national agility champion and is very bored and wants to do things that are no longer safe. Right. So now you have to set up parameters. So one would be um, if you have a space in your home where you can have an open area that you could set up, that you could have your own. She could still do agility in your house. Now, you're not going to do like maybe the A-frame. You're not going to do the walk across, but you could have low level. You could make them be only six inches off the ground. It's about that doingness. She still has to be doing. So one thing would be is to create low level that are in the same place that she can go do and run. And she probably, because she was that skilled, would do them herself. Another thing would be is that the sensory, like her olfactory system may have augmented because her vision is not as good. So do do in an area you could do a hide and go seek where she's going to be following her nose so for this you're not going to have anything in her way but you could have a box and when she gets to that box there's some kind of a hole that she kind of puts her nose in it and flips it and then she gets the treat out of the box and then she's going to follow her nose somewhere because you're playing this hide and go seek and it may be a tube and then like she could go through the tunnel and you could put some snacks in the tunnel and so she walks through the tunnel and then you could have something that she's going to, you could just do that. You could be, the ideas are endless of how you could create, which is using her mind. It's keeping her happy. It's doing this. Then the other is too, you can still take her out on a walk and she will know. And this is one where you would do the same thing every day. And she will get to know, she will learn how many steps to the end of the block how many steps before you turn and go here? She will use her ear. She will use her nose. She will know the difference in the feel of the ground. If you go from asphalt to uh, cement sidewalk to grass, gravel, she will know how long that walk is. She will know how close you are to home as you do those. And because of that, she'll be a much happier dog and you won't feel so like you're letting her down. This was really a good question, Nancy. I'm really happy you asked this because I feel bad for you, bad for her, and we're not supposed to feel bad. So hopefully by sharing that, it gives you some ideas of things you can do for her that create that fun. Because I can see her, Boston and Terry, they're all about enjoying life and they're such happy dogs. So thank you for that. Uh, let's see here. Ella, I don't know about an easy walk collar. Um, one of those things would uh, uh, you'd have to check out. Okay, the prong collar does not damage the thyroid as long as the, I would, the, this is the same place where a regular collar is. So the, a regular collar that a dog is going to hold on, it puts more pressure around. That's right over the larynx, the thyroid, the parathyroid. And the prong, the dog will back off of. They have more respect. I mean, if you are holding that prong collar, if that prong collar is tight, like I said, there should be a little give that when they relax, it's not still poking on them. So you would have to have a major thrust there to damage. I mean, like to bruise the thyroid, like somebody doing a karate chop there, you maybe could get something, but the dog should back off before that happens. I don't, I don't see that. I've used the prong collar for lots of years and recommended it for many. And when used properly. I can't even imagine that. I think that's somebody maybe that just thought it and never really was in the arena of dog obedience or dog physical therapy or uh, used it on, or had a dog that they used it on. I, I think that was out of not enough knowledge. All right. But again, that's my input on that one. Maybe somebody else has something else, but hey, I've been a vet for 42 years, so I've never, never seen that happen. All righty. Um, Okay, this person believes that the regular collars and the thyroid and the and the prong collars do damage the thyroid. I don't know. I don't see that. But at any rate, you know what? Everybody comes from a different perspective. And as I said, if somebody doesn't use them properly, I could see that that could be a damaging thing. Yes, that you have to train the release. Right. It has to be that it's loose most of the time. It only tightens up and tightens up a little bit when they get to the to a point where 
If not, you have to just use the harness and then you have to become stronger yourself. Alrighty, so some of the other topics we had today um, on massage. So I'm sure there's some of you out there that already do some massage in your um, animals, but uh, the programs today could have given you some other little ideas. And you definitely got to see how much the dogs enjoy that. And also the more you do the massage, if you can do those things at home, the less often you will have to go see the chiropractor or go see, have your, your physical therapy appointments will get uh, spaced out more physiotherapy, uh, depending on where you live and who owns those words, that the more that you do, then the less time that you, because it holds the adjustments, it maintains that body. Even if you're going to an acupuncturist, the more of those other things you do, learning acupressure and all that, you do that in between times, then it pushes out the amount of time that you're actually having damage to the, you know, from falling, stumbling, getting body blasted by their, their roommate and then uh, needing to go back for help. Okay. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so those demos of the massage was really, really good. Um, all right. Okay, so, okay, so Carol says she learned about the adductor muscles today. Yes. Um, so, so just so you understand, those adductor muscles are the ones on the inside of the legs that help hold together. And those are some that in the older dog can become very, very tight. And so you'll see those dogs where their body, the rear end is always like pulled in. And when you start to feel those muscles, those adductors, because they're adding them to the body versus the ab, abductors, abductors are the ones that pull the, the legs away from the body. So what we want to do is to loosen up those adductors so they're not, this is the ones that Suzanne Plachette years ago with her leg massage thing was showing people how to build those adductors in the people. But in these old dogs, they get way too tight. So using massage on those and then improving the tone of the abductors so that they can get a better balance there in that rear end and they're not always being pulled together. So thank you about that. All right, let's see here. Let's see what else we can come up with on questions about today's program. Uh, any other points here? All right, we could talk a little bit about Reiki. Um, again, probably one of the things that some of you have been trained in. Uh, and also all of the individuals that we visited with today, all of the presenters, you'll be able to access them. All of their contact information is in the playbook. And you can go to their sites and a lot of them do have courses that you can sign up for and learn how to do those, like how to do kinesio taping, how to do Reiki, uh, how to do massage. There's there's training that uh, that you can you can utilize there and become better. And it's the confidence factor. You're building that confidence in yourself. Uh, Gail asks if there's a laser that I'd recommend. And the one that I do recommend is the Revitavet. And that's why they're one of our sponsors is because I have used those since the 1990s. And um, the, the product is safe and it's very effective. It has seven different frequency channels. So there's a lot you can do with that. And they're, you know, it's cost, everything's going to have a price to it, but they're not that expensive. And you can uh, add on, so you can start with a lesser and then add on as your finances permit you to. So that would be the ones that I would recommend. And I talked a little bit about the other day, how you can even use them on really bad ear infections. So if you've got an older dog that's had lots of ear problems, you just lift up the pinna and lay that laser inside the ear there, light on the ear, so it's open, and that healing light then can help with those deep-seated otitis chronic problems while you're working to improve the microbiome and get the rest of the immune system functioning, getting their pH down, all those other things that you do, but it gives you a way out in the interim. All righty.
Oh, okay. Gail's saying she thought it was like a pen. So in the program uh, yesterday that um, uh, we the, the program on the lasers yesterday, got a mental block right now. But at any rate, so a pen, that is like like the bicycle that, that she talked about. The bicycle uh, is is like the pen versus the Lamborghini which would be more like the pad. You, you want to have those far infrared as well as the, the um, so you have the visual as well as the non-visual light spectrum so that you can get more of those frequencies. The pen's only going to just do like skin surface things. You're not going to get deep enough to really get a, a good therapeutic treatment. Yep. So that's good. The, the pens are good for the cat for chasing the dot on the wall. They can have fun with that, but it's not going to be that much of a therapeutic device. All right, let's see here. What else have we got going? We did talk a little bit too in the programs about realizing that you don't, on the, on the senior dogs, you don't exercise them every single day. You want to give them a little bit of downtime in between. So you can alternate your days of exercise. You can uh, have it to where maybe one day you do one type of exercise, like you go into the gym, and another day you do a different type of exercise. So you're varying the body. Also, um, doing uh, smaller increments of the exercise several times a day. So rather than just having a certain time in the afternoon that you go out and you have your exercise program is to divide it up and do shorter increments, which also as they're older, depending on your home situation, you might be able to do a little bit of the exercise inside. So you also could do, you could add in some of what we talked about yesterday, doing warm compresses in the morning, a little bit of massage, uh, then, so now the body is ready to go, and then maybe you have a little short walk, or you do your warm compress massage, and then in the middle of the day, you go out, depending on where you're at and what the temperatures are, then you have a little bit of a walk, and then later in the afternoon, you may have your exercise stuff set up, and you go in the yard, and you do a little bit of trotting around this, and climbing on that, and then in the evening, you do your cool compresses over if you've got arthritic joints going on in your dog, so maybe cold compress on the elbow or shoulder or hip or knee, wherever that is to, to cool those areas. So you can create a little program along the way, dividing it up. Certainly if you're working all day, then that makes a difference and you won't have that latitude, but you can do that on the weekend and then make it be a little different during the week. Yes, I think the pug was enjoying it. All right. I think it would be interesting to see how many people out there have actually used kinesio tape themselves, either on your body or used it on your animal or had a practitioner who applied the kinesio tape. Because it's really, really interesting how um, quickly it can make you feel. And uh, the fact that early on with the kinesio taping, we were thinking we'd have to apply it you know, shave the dog or it would only work on short hair. But the fact that it can actually, by elevating the fur itself and the hair follicles, it can help move that skin up away, which opens a channel for circulation to move through and then changes the lymphatic flow inside the body. That makes it to where we can apply it to a lot more bodies without having to do the shaving. Okay, so Peter asks, do I recommend harnesses for healthy dogs at all? Sure. Um, and he says, my stand on this subject is that if your dog doesn't pull, you don't need a harness. Well, the harness can just be that maybe the dog needs more body support. So the dog may not pull, but if the dog is weak, the harness is more like a saddle where it distributes weight over a larger area. So you have to think about where you're pulling from, and I don't want to use the word pull, but where your connection, where the connection is from the dog's body to the leash that goes to your arm. So you're going along and then you're going to turn and maybe the dog, I've seen people do this where they're yakking and they're not paying attention to where the dog is and they turn and they just like pull the dog around really fast. Well, for an older body, your your leverage point now is only at the neck if you're not using a harness. 
And so the rest of their body moves more. The, 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 the point of, of that center point, the fulcrum of motion is based on where you're attached to them. So if it's only at the neck and you pull, that whole rear end is swinging more. It's at more in a, of an effect versus if you're connected in the middle and that's where you're pulling from. You can guide that rear end. So these older individuals, they're already having difficulty with those messages and signals getting to the rear end. And it's more difficult them, for them also, their reaction time takes longer. So they can't like hop to it as quick as they used to. So having the harness is key because it allows you to have a center point closer to their center of gravity which is gentler and kinder on motion when you're moving. Also, some of those that have the handle that you can pick up a little bit as you're going, as long as like you're not super tall and the dog's super short. Um, but on some of those where you're out walking and they're starting to get tired and then they start dragging their feet because they're more tired and you didn't realize it was they were going to get tired that quick, but you still got to get home. So either you got to pick them up and carry them to help Maybe you can't carry them because they're too big. But if you have those ones with the harness that has enough tummy application that you can lift them a little bit, you take a lot of pounds off of their weight. So I've done this before with the big scale at the clinic and then showed the, the, the pet parent, the dog with the harness, that when you pick up, like we could take a dog that was 80 pounds and just, and it wasn't that much of us, you know, like not much effort on my part to elevate, to pull up just enough that the dog's weight would drop from 60 down to like 47 pounds. And so that's a lot on their feet that they're not having to manage against gravity. So now they can go further. They can lift their legs up better because they've got help. So those would be the reasons to use a harness uh, on a dog that even though they're not pulling, that you would want that benefit of having a harness. Oh, so here Buki says, we're back to the kinesio tape. She said she's allergic to it. So I didn't even think about that, but that's a good thing to be observant of that either the adhesive on there or the fabric itself, that there are some individuals that it may not be optimal. But maybe since on the dogs, you're at the you're on the outside where the skin is and we don't have to get, you're at the fur, we don't have to get down on the skin that it might be beneficial. Uh, Carol says her chiropractor uses it, works well. She asked her dog's chiropractor if it could help him and she has not yet been trained in that modality. Yeah, keep encouraging her. But now you've also seen how it can be done. You can watch some of those videos. You can even get some training on doing that and then start focusing on those areas, those zones in your dog that are that are weak and problematic and adding that kinesio tape to it. All right, so here we have a question. My 15-year-old ex-working cocker has degenerative myelopathy. Would chiropractic treatment help? And then part two is his back legs are getting weak. Uh, he has get up, but he doesn't get very far. Okay. So yes, he can push it up, but then he wears out pretty quickly. So yes, chiropractic would, would be is part of the program for DM because any area where there's subluxations and any kind of nerve input is reduced, then in the situation where you have DM, that's a domino that just adds a whole lot more fall to them. So if we can open up any, even if it's 25% that improves the DM, then that's a gain. Um, the other thing then is looking at some of those exercises that Laurie was talking about to help with those type 2 fibers so we can get a little bit more strength in them. Uh, another exercise that I have that I do with this is to just to help keep that proprioception. So when they start dragging and dragging and they're not putting the foot on the ground, every time they place on the ground and they have weight on it, there's a signal that's going to the brain that's telling them about the foot and, and about uh, workload. And so when they get weaker like this and they're kind of dragging, their foot's not getting that signal all the time. So there's actually an exercise I have that I show my clients to do. And you take, so this is the dog's paw and this is your hand and you're going to press up. And I have them pump that foot 
move that foot just like if they were walking and they were pressing on the ground. And they'll do 20 pumps, up to 20 pumps at a time. And then, of course, you'd have to do it with the other rear leg, too, because sometimes the DM is more accentuated on one side than another, but it could be on both. And the other thing I'd say, too, about that is we don't know all about the DM, and there certainly are some genetic lines that that shows up and you can have the test like with the corgis and with the german shepherds and that but um a lot this can just be muscle weakness nerve weakness and degeneration just means it's coming on and it's getting worse as you get older so there are a lot of different things to do to help take the why out which might be a detox program supporting the nerves with uh, different nutrients, as well as the laser, uh, the alpha stem we're going to talk about tomorrow with this and how that integrates all those four pain pathways, which is another one of the programs that I have. Our first week of the post-summit course is going to be on the four pain pathways and understanding why we have to target all of those in order to get nerve function going through the whole body. All right. Thank you for that. Uh, Okay, so Emma says she puts her dog for a ride in her power chair. Yeah, that's pretty cute too. We see them all the time out there in the little buggies and that kind of thing. Uh, so Peter said, I realize front attach harnesses are not great, especially long term, correct. But for training short term, they might be pretty good. I could imagine. Have you had any experience? So I've had lots of dogs that come in with those uh, front flips. I suspect, as you're saying, if you're doing a training point and um, you wanted to, um, if you were doing a specific kind of training and you wanted to help with that, like you said, short term, then they may be okay. The other thing that I see with a lot of those front clips is they're also the ones that then cause the restriction over the shoulder. And so, that's not so good. So you have to just see how it fits and decide how long are you going to use this, but certainly not the only harness that you would use all the time. But if you're trying to get a point across and you use it for a few minutes during your training time, then yes, that would be good. I mean, good to give it a go and then see how your dog responds. All right. So Carol was asking about supporting the nervous system with supplements. Um, so, uh, some of this will come along tomorrow when we talk about the aging processes and how to help support the bodies. Uh, there would have been a little bit of that with the nerves in the CBD lecture. So we can use the CBD to help with the nerves. Um, and then also, uh, supplements, there are like folic acid is important for the nerves. Vitamin E is important for the nerves. There are a lot of different aspects that we can look at nutritionally that help support the nerves. Also, if the nerves are being damaged because of latent viruses, so uh, St. John's wort can be one of the things that I use that. It helps with ones that have like back trauma or the dachshunds that have, have deficits now because of a disc that's injured the spinal cord, but also then um, you can use it in those that have like some kind of a vaccinosis where the the herpes virus it's very good for going after herpes viruses so there's a lot of different ways that you can uh, target nerve support and we certainly can visit some of that as we go uh, one of the programs in my post summit course too is going to be about Lyme and it talks we look in this program about the aspects of this uh, trifecta that sets off uh, the, of the virus, the heavy metal, and then something that's a trigger, which oftentimes can be the Borrelia, but not all the time. But we'll look at what do we need to do to help support these nerves in, in those programs as well. Thank you, Wendy. Nice to see you there. Living in Florida part of the time. Thanks for being a part of the summit and uh, appreciating, as you say, amazing information. Uh, any And then uh, Buki says, any specific type of vitamin E that you recommend? So most of the vitamin E that you see out is going to say tocopherol, alpha, beta, gamma, delta. Those are the four antioxidants that protect all of the ingredients inside the whole vitamin E complex. But when you're supporting the nervous system, you want to get that whole vitamin E complex. So you certainly can get that out of flax as long as the flax is fresh 
You don't want to have old flax. You want to have all of the flax too. Um, so that's one way to get it. Uh, I use a lot of standard process and they do have a cataplex E, which is all of the whole vitamin E because it's that inside the whole vitamin. It's not the antioxidant that help reduce scarring. It's the, um, the parts inside that vitamin E complex. So we have E3, which is the anti-scarring part of the vitamin E. And then we have E2, which is inside underneath all of these four shells, those four antioxidants. The E2 is the part of the whole vitamin E that helps increase oxygen carrying capacity in the blood. So the E2 extract is something that we utilize on ones that are having problems getting air. Older ones are ones that have heart conditions that need more oxygenation or COPD and need more oxygenation all of those. So we want to look at that E2 factor. Okay, so rolling along here. You're welcome for that. Let's see if there's anything up here that we've kind of missed out on. All right, let me go to my list here and see if something else from today that we can pull up and get some more conversation going. Oh, the obesity part. That's one of the things we haven't really talked about too much is um, being able to assess for that overweightness. And I do, there are some, thank you, Bunny. There are some that uh, older dogs that are too thin some people focus so much on not wanting them to get overweight because of the arthritis that they're actually nutrient deprived. So they got to have the muscle. They have to have enough muscle tone to move those joints around, to move the body and support the body. So we don't want them to get too thin. So if you're looking at your dog and that your dog is like six or seven or eight and you realize they're really too thin, now would be the time while you have time and they can exercise more to so work at getting more good protein into their body. Uh, getting some of the fats that they need to help build. The dogs burn fats first as their energy source. And that's why you'll see on those raw diets and those archetype diets, the fat content and the protein content are both fairly close and that the carbohydrate content is very minimal because they burn fats first and carbs second versus people burn carbs first and then fat second. So we can't formulate a diet for ourselves, it's going to specifically perfectly match the dog's digestive processes and what they need. So first up, we want to make sure they're not too skinny. And if they are early on, start building them up and getting them more filled in. And then if you have one that's older, then and that it is overweight, sometimes, so I feel bad for the clients that come in that have been feeding a weight loss diet, that have been exercising the dog, they've been following the directions of their traditional veterinarian, and it just doesn't budge. So sometimes we really have to get their metabolism to shift before that weight is going to start to come off. And that can take weeks to get the metabolism to shift. And there's some things that we do. So a lot of times in trying to get this metabolism to shift, I'll actually go into using some kind of a general cardiac formula. So say the dog's 10 or 12 or whatever, and it's stuck and you just can't get a change. So we look at formulas that are designed as a blend to support heart function, because that's about metabolism and motion and movement. And so that is oftentimes a good base to start with. So I use standard processes, canine cardiac support, but uh, feline cardiac support and not saying that they have a heart problem, but it's because it's about metabolism. Alpha lipoic acid is also another entity that's really good in trying to help shift that metabolism. The other thing certainly is getting them off of a kibble food. That's going to be a big, a biggie and working through whatever their dosha is and uh, into do they need it cooked? Can they eat it raw? Is freeze dried going to work better for your routine and better for them? Also is feeding them instead of once or twice a day is to feeding them more time so that you get the metabolism of their body moving more often. And that can oftentimes get that shift. And then realizing too, what program you start as far as supplements to get them going, that's for a period of time, but it's not forever. So the body should kick in and be able to go. We also have to have a really well-functioning endocrine system. And that doesn't mean driving the thyroid too fast. It just means they all have to be in balance. So we need to have the digestion from the teeth 
through the intestines for absorption working right, enough enzymes in the stomach to break it down so it can be absorbed. And then uh, from that aspect, having then the right nutrients to help push that metabolism to go. And then use your measurements. So you can take tape measurement and measure around their chest, measure around their loin with the tape, measuring tape and keep track, keep a little score sheet so you can see as they're losing because they will change in dimension as well. All right, so we have one of Dr. Edwards students who practices the his program on the, his dog. Oh, that has DM. Uh, runs with his back legs, kind of bunny hopping. It does help, and I highly recommend his practice. Okay, so um, so Samantha is a student of Dr. Edwards, who's one of our sponsors in the Healing Vet and that program with the uh, Whole Energy Body Balance program and how she's working with a dog that has DM. So another one of the ways that we can open up those channels, get the flow, find that silent pain that may be a part of the lack of function, especially the silent pain that's been building, building, building for time. And now the body just can't accommodate. And again, all of these things that you do, even if this one improves it by 15%, this improves 25%, this improves 40%, you, you build on that momentum and then see that you can reverse whatever's happening. So, and don't give up with just one thing. Uh, don't give up if you do one thing and then that hasn't seemed to help. Is like, look for something else. Or because your senior dog is older, it may take longer than what you might have anticipated to see again. And I usually, especially this was one of my, of the dogs doing the underwater treadmill. When do you quit? So we have a dog that was paralyzed. They couldn't walk. We're doing therapy. They're in the underwater treadmill. They're starting to move their legs. How do you know when to quit doing the underwater treadmill? So my point is you will continue to do this until we get to beyond two weeks and there's been no progress whatsoever. So any progress, even a minute little progress, and the first might be that they actually stand up a little bit when they're at home and they have all the gravity working against them, or they were able to scratch themselves. Any kind of progress during a two-week time is progress. So you continue going in any little bit over that two-week time, you keep doing what you're doing. So that, that would be kind of a marker for what to look for. Alrighty, so I want to thank everybody for being with us for this Senior Dog Care Pet Summit, for joining in not only to the opening, we had our launch party, to watching, we're, day, we're up to day three, we have day four coming tomorrow, and that's going to be our aging, stress, comfort, and then we're also going to look at when it's getting close, when it's the end of lifetime, and to give you some programs, some pointers, some things that you can use to help you know when is the time so that you don't get into that struggle and uh, start feeling bad about whatever decision that you have to make. And um, then also encouraging you to consider uh, getting the VIP. So a lot of these videos you'll be able to watch six months from now, nine months from now, um, two years from now, when you have a dog that you want to, to do that with. And the other thing, too, is that things come to us in our universe at a point in time when we're ready to either experience it, hear it, receive it, own it. And so this is why we're always learning. What you listen to this weekend and these, during these four programs and what you pick up on is where you're at right now you'll be at a different learning point. You will be at a different need point down the road. And so being able to come back on and watch and the next time you watch, you go, I've had this before where I've gone to presenters and, and listened to a program again that they're giving or watched one that I had on a video. And I go, I didn't remember him saying that the last time. That's because it wasn't what I needed to hear that day. But today I'm ready for it. It is what I'm supposed to and so then when you hear it, you get it, and then you use it. Um, thank you, Peter. I, this has had been fun. Peter says, thank you for hosting the summit. We're learning a lot, and it has been a whole lot of fun. So think about uh, then also signing up for the post course. 
We're looking for 20 people that are super charged, really want to learn more. Uh, I showed you at the beginning the bundle of the extras that you're going to get. And uh, we'll focus on the four pathways of pain. We're going to do a whole um, program week of the Lyme and the trifecta with that, which bleeds into many of degenerative conditions. Uh, we're also going to have an Ayurveda class, which is a whole lot of fun. And then there's also one about the hair mineral analysis, learning how to really understand what are the underlying problems uh, with the body when nutrition is missing. So stay tuned for more. Thank you for being here and we'll catch you again tomorrow. Happy trails.